Thank you. What that should be saying is why 21st century India cannot do without artificial intelligence. That's what I'm here to talk to you guys about. Back in 2007, researchers hypothesized that one of the first signs of the gap closing between human intelligence and artificial intelligence would be the day when machines finally beat humans at Go. The ancient strategy game from China that's more than 2,500 years old. To understand why beating human beings at strategy games is so difficult for computers, I want to draw your attention to the 1996-1997 match between Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue by IBM. Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov using a brute force approach to explore the set of candidate moves. This is really impressive. The total set of positions that are possible in chess is 10 to the power of 123. The total atoms in the entire universe is just 10 to the power of 80. To put that into context, that difference is larger than the entire age of the universe in nanoseconds. Go, on the other hand, has a positional complexity of 10 to the power of 360. Computers can't even begin to explore the space necessary to brute force it. Computers have to mimic ingenuity, creativity, and intelligence to come up with the moves that would work. They need to be able to feel and see patterns just the way humans see them. In 2016, AlphaGo, built by some of the really smart people at Google, beat one of the best mankind had to offer at Go. What surprised people, though, was the fact that it wasn't even close. AlphaGo came up with moves that people who had played the game for decades had never even seen before. In just a couple of years, AlphaGo had beat someone who had spent their entire life perfecting this game. This dominance isn't just limited to games, though. Today, AI follows us everywhere. When you're stalking your girlfriend on Facebook, it's AI that powers the ads that you see. AI shows you which movies you're likely to want to watch and knows what songs you prefer even before you know it yourself. It drives cars better than you do. It can read CT scans better than humans have ever been able to do it. And today, it even directs our traffic. The rate at which investments in artificial intelligence are increasing, it's almost certain that almost every job or task that involves simple logic or involves basic hand-eye coordination is likely to be automated away. Now, when I tell this story or talk about these things to most people in India, uh, the people who don't believe me usually come from two camps. The first line of thinking goes something like this. Yeah, it's coming, but it's still pretty far away. It's going to take a long time to get here. The thought process here assumes that until we actually see it around us, it's actually not happening. The second line of thinking, which is more common, is by experts, people who've been in industry for a long time. And they tell me that, you know, yeah, I understand that AI is coming, but it's not coming to my industry anytime soon. The argument here is that in India, labor competitiveness will stay for a long time, and artificial intelligence is not likely to be competitive anytime soon. Alternatively, the quality that AI will offer will never even be close to what humans can do today. This line of thinking is actually not new at all. Back in the early 1900s, uh, a very famous uh, banker once believed that automobiles were just a fad, and actually horse-drawn carriages would dominate the entire, the entire world for a really long time. Um, just a few years later, the sale of cars had almost increased 20x. Moore's Law, which a lot of you have probably heard about, has made such predictions go in huge numbers. For example, in 1977, someone predicted that personal computers were never really going to become a thing at all. Just four years later, IBM had already sold 100,000 personal computers. And my favorite one is by Thomas Watson himself. Um, and this one needs no explanation at all. The world market is much, much larger, as we all know, than just five computers. When we think about the impact that AI is ha having in the world today, 
This is not to suggest that these experts or these industry leaders were naive or ignorant. It's just that all of us, myself included, are really, really bad at understanding the effects of an exponential function until we really force ourselves to do so. The rate at which investments in artificial intelligence are growing are indeed exponential, just like Moore's law was. If we in 1977, in 1997, couldn't conceive of a world in which every Indian had a cell phone with internet one day, we cannot even begin to understand what AI will make our world look like 20 years from now. The world that AI is go most going to affect in India is actually not represented in this room today. India 2 or India 3, as this is sometimes known as, are people who live in villages or have families that still live in villages. These are people who've not had the same educational opportunities that a lot of us have had. These are people who still work largely in the informal sector and are still comfortable in their local or regional languages. I recently met a friend of mine who works with some of the largest tea gardens in India, and I asked him, is technology being used in any of your processes? And he told me that, Arpan, until very recently, we struggled with a problem where our tea pickers would go and pick tea leaves, and they would be mixed with really ripe leaves, which would be yellow, and less ripe leaves, which would be green. And this mixture actually reduced the price of the tea because the quality wasn't as pure anymore. And we had to hand separate these out. He told me that they had recently purchased a machine that used simple computer vision to actually separate out these leaves for them. And these machines were doing it better and faster than any human had ever done. This change isn't just happening to tea. In agriculture alone, which employs almost 50% of the Indian population, already you have autonomous tractors, you have drones that can spread pesticides, and you have har cropped harvesting autonomous robots that are already available in the markets today. This is not just limited to agriculture, of course. In manufacturing, as we try to stay more competitive with our counterparts in China, which are heavily investing in autonomous technologies and AI, the forcing function forces manufacturers to adopt more and more automated processes. In the service sector, call centers, which employ hundreds of thousands of Indians every single year, are already seeing growth stagnate. Chatbots, which you must have all heard about, are no longer just mimicking the way we talk. They're doing it better than us. They, can't, they, they, they can draw upon a much wider set of facts and are able to be a lot more persistent and patient with angry customers than we could ever be. All of this becomes very, very relevant when we think about the statistics of what the workforce of India looks like today. And the numbers are chilling. Almost 92% of India's workforce is in the informal sector, with 30% of these people being daily wage laborers. Only 2% of India's workforce is said to be skilled, and only 30% of us are actually graduates. If artificial intelligence completely destroyed some of the best minds that we have at purely intellectual tasks, you can imagine what it's going to do to entire industries that are largely manually focused. Now, as you can imagine, the challenges that we face with this upcoming AI wave are pretty serious. And unfortunately, India is not ready for them. From a policy perspective, we're investing heavily into increasing our manufacturing with schemes like Make in India. But what is absent from the debate completely is the role that autonomous vehicles, AI, or synthetic intelligences are likely to pay, play. The more we automate, which is going to become the requirement to remain competitive in a global economy, the lesser and lesser we'll require people to actually do these tasks. While we will increase a lot of value and generate it, it is unlikely that it will actually solve the employment problems that India is likely to see in the future. Usually, in a lot of other economies, the private sector steps in here and actually provides and make, creates their jobs and the roles that actually are created in the new economic structure that emerges. In other countries, like the US and China, you have companies such as Google, Amazon, Netflix, that are investing heavily into artificial intelligence. They invest billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars, into their hardware, human capital, and software to enable such products and technologies to actually take place. In India, we are 
very, very, very far behind. The biggest companies in India very often are not even looking at this sector, and the startups are not globally competitive at all. When we look at the funding that countries receive, India is nowhere in the list. Similarly, the patents that are generated globally in the field of artificial intelligence, again, India is nowhere on this list at all. Just this year alone, $3 billion of money is going to be invested into just into startups that are uh, based on artificial intelligence. Almost zero of these dollars will actually reach India. I want to focus a little bit more on the fact that a large percentage of what enables countries and enables economies to actually do a lot of AI work is the research facilities. And even here, our research institutes are largely falling behind their global competitors. Now, I can see all the really sad faces in this room, and I don't want to depress you guys any further. And I want to be very clear. I'm actually very, very optimistic for what AI will mean for India. Just like the previous wealth-generating periods that have existed in mankind, whether it was the Industrial Revolution or the age of computers and the internet, even though India did not lead the development of these revolutions, we benefited from them greatly. And the same will be true of the artificial intelligence revolution. A great example that I like to always talk about is how since the 1960s, farms in India have become increasingly mechanized. Use of tractors has grown almost 60-fold, and the labor participation has fallen drastically over the same period. In the same time, though, Indians have actually increased their food output, and we are better fed than we ever were before. We must look at AI in the same way. The debate is much more nuanced. As Ola and Uber continue to bring autonomous vehicles, the costs of transportation will fall drastically. As Foxconn replaces their workers with robots, our smartphones will become cheaper and cheaper. Today's Indians can afford more things than Indians ever did in history, and a large part of this is because of the autom autonomous processes that have driven costs down exponentially. This benefit will extend over time in the future as well. The other thing I want to focus on is the fact that in terms of where we are, we're in the equivalent of the 1950s of the computer revolution. Most companies do not dominate the entire space of artificial intelligence. They do what we call narrow AI or weak AI, which is very specialized and focused artificial intelligence developments in very focused fields. Google is great at presenting you ads, and it's great at autonomous vehicles. Amazon is great at giving you recommendations. They don't do everything really well. This leaves tremendous room for companies to come in and add a lot of value in a very short amount of time. My favorite example here is Baidu. The Chinese search giant until five years ago was not known at all for their work in artificial intelligence. At that point in time, they created Baidu Research and hired one of the top minds in artificial intelligence in the entire world. Just in the last five years alone, they have broken numerous world records in machine translation and speech-to-text technologies. Today, they have their own self-driving car project as well. All of this was achieved in just five years. That's how quickly this field is moving. That's how much scope there is today. Finally, I think we're really fortunate to be in India amongst a group of people who are really, really forward-looking and optimistic, and our students are really, really vibrant and thinking about machine learning very actively. The interest that Indian students have dis displayed is almost one of the largest in the entire world. If you, look, if you look at the courses that are taken on global platforms in this, in this extremely flat economy that we have today, uh, Indians are one of the largest consumers of courses on Coursera, and machine learning is one of the topmost courses there. Increasingly, doing machine, machine learning research with technologies that have released, such as TensorFlow, and using the Amazon cloud services or other cloud services, enables almost any one of us to start contributing to this field. And this brings me to why I'm most excited to be speaking with you today. Artificial intelligence is not just about the technology and the algorithms. It's just as much about the data. Peter Norwig, who was head of Google Research, once famously said, we don't have better algorithms. We just have much more data. When we look at India 2 and India 3, no one has this data today. The products that were designed by people thousands of miles away for Indians 
were designed for people like us in this room today. They do not have to think about how we use the products because we were just like them. When it comes to the next 700 million Indians who are going to come online, things are going to be very different. The products are going to be very different and the use cases are going to be very, very different. This is a remarkable opportunity for Indian companies, people like you and I, to step in, understand what would provide value, and generate a new wave of development in this economy. Just over the next three four to four years, until 2020, AI is expected to add $1.2 trillion in global GDP. Some companies, fortunately, in India are already realizing this. Reliance Geo is a fantastic example of a long-term data play. By creating a subscriber base of 100 million users in very quick time, it doesn't just control the gateway to the internet for these people. It has a front row seat onto which apps these people are using and how they're using their data. India missed out on the boat and did not get a chance to lead the Industrial Revolution, and it did not get the chance to lead the Internet Revolution. We must not miss the chance to lead the Artificial Intelligence Revolution. Thank you.